Dear colleagues, welcome to today's European Association on Cardiovascular Imaging webinar on myocardial work by pressure strain loops. My name is uh, Professor, I'm Professor Otto Smithet from the Oslo University Hospital in Norway, and I have the pleasure of being joined by two experts in the field. It's Dr. Martin Finiska from the Hospital of Als in Belgium and is Professor Ervan Donal from the University Hospital in Rennes in France. The aim of the webinar is to give you a better understanding of why and when you should measure myocardial work. The session is interactive and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. For the best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in online assessment sessions in the form of MCQs that will be submitted during presentations. Uh, my conflict of interest is that I was one of the inventors of the work method, but I got no financial relationship any longer. It's the hospital who has that. After watching the webinar, we hope you will be able to do the following to understand the pathophysiology behind myocardial work. You should know how to use this novel technique in clinical practice. Furthermore, you should understand the role of myocardial work in the diagnosis of some of the cardiomyopathies. And finally, you should get some insights into how to predict CRT response by work assessment of in the myocardium. In general, when you're doing cardiac imaging, we do it to diagnose disease. We also do it to guide therapy. But importantly now, we are focusing more and more on using imaging to identify the disease before people really get sick. It's their pre-symptomatic disease. Now, the myocardial work is a little bit complicated, but hopefully not too much. We have been able to bring the myocardial work concept from the animal laboratory to the patients. And uh, this thing started in 1979 by a beautiful publication to the left here you see from the Japanese scientist Suga. In an animal study, he measured LV pressure and volume. And he could show that the area of the LV pressure volume loop equaled myocardial work or left ventricular work and also was a reflector of myocardial oxygen consumption. So the myocardial or LV pressure work loop has been looked for if you can do it in patients for about 40 years now. Finally, I had a couple of very good people working with me when they did this innovation in Oslo a few years ago. It was Christopher Russell who was a fellow and uh, Martin Eriksson who was uh, a great guy to have on the team. And then they innovated the work method in Oslo in about 2012, and now it has been implemented into clinical practice. The right slide, the right panel on the slides shows you from a patient with heart failure. And you see elder pressure, and you see the segmental strain in the myocardium of this patient. You see the loop has two lines, one line is the solid line, that's the invasively measured pressure, which you measure to validate to see if the pressure we now estimate by echo is a good one. Because this innovation contained a novel way to measure or estimate LV pressure by echo only. And as you see, the dashed line, that is the pressure by echo, is very really close to the measured pressure by the high fidelity catheter. And that was the big novelty which started the work sort of expansion as a method. Now, a couple of concepts. Everything new is sometimes a little bit strange and uh, the work method has a couple of concepts. You see again, LV pressure and you see strain in the patient. The loop to the left is from the septum. It looks very abnormal. The loop to the right is from the LV lateral wall in a patient, in the same patient. And you see the loop to the right looks like it's a nice looking loop with a, for those of you who are used to looking at loops, it looks nice. The one from the septum 
has a gray shaded area, and the gray area is the time during the heart cycle when the septum is stretched. And in fact, the shaded area is work which is wasted. We call it wasted work. Now to the right, you see a color display, but let's start on the top. On the top, you see this concept, myocardial work efficiency. <clears throat> to get the work efficiency, we measure by echo. That's what you can do yourself now with echo. We measure what they call the constructive work, that's the open, the healthy work. And then we have under the line, we have the wasted work plus the constructive work. So ideally, you should have 100% constructive work. It's never feasible. You get between 93 and 97 usually in a healthy heart. But the work efficiency tells you if the heart is working as an efficient pump. In the lower right panel, you see the red area. It's a bad part. That's inefficient. The green part is good. That's where it's healthy working segments generating constructive work. Now, in this slide, we have you can see the same patient to the left, with the red being the inefficient work, and to the remaining part, the green is the good work, the healthy work. And we put on the CRT pacemaker on this patient, you have the left bundle branch block, you see everything becomes green and nice. So the CRT was able to correct the inefficient work to healthy good work remarkably. I can tell you we are working together, uh, Armando Nall uh, and uh, Marty Pinita and several others, and we are publishing a paper in the European Heart Journal in a few weeks, where we have validated and tested if the work method can really be used to select patients for CRT and find the responders. I cannot tell you what they found because of the embargo of the publication, but it's keep your eyes on the journal, European Heart Journal, in the next few weeks, you'll find something. Now, the, uh, I will give the microphone to uh, Dr. Martin Pinicha, who will uh, entertain you or learn you about the work method. Please. Thank you, Otto. Hello to everyone. I have nothing to disclose. So myocardial work is a non-invasive index of left ventricular systolic performance incorporating both deformation and afterload. Therefore, it's less load dependent than currently used indices to evaluate systolic functions such as ejection fraction and global longitudinal strain. Myocardial work is derived as the area of the pressure strain loop where pressure represents cuff brachial artery pressure and strain is derived by speckle tracking echocardiography. Myocardial work correlates highly and significantly with myocardial energetics and glucose metabolism, and therefore it's a very promising tool for diagnosis, prediction of prognosis, and monitoring effects of therapy in patients with heart failure, cardiomyopathy, CRT candidates, or patients undergoing cancer treatment. Let me start with the case of potential cancer treatment-related cardiac dysfunction. This is the 55 years old woman, her two positive breast cancer plan for potential cardiotoxic drug regimen, including epirubicin, cyclophosphamide, and trastuzumab. Baseline echocardiography showed preserved left ventricular ejection fraction, preserved global longitudinal strain, normal blood pressure, and normal global work index. This is the situation six months later she had no symptoms. Ejection fraction remains normal, while we observed significant drop in global longitudinal strain by 16%. In contrast, blood pressure increased between baseline and follow-up, as did global work index. And now we are facing important clinical question. Is this the case of cancer treatment-related cardiac dysfunction? Should the administration of cancer therapy be interrupted and shall we start the cardioprotective medication? And I will answer these questions in a couple of following minutes. So let me introduce you to the concept of myocardial work and review briefly all the work that has been done to develop non-invasive myocardial work assessment. 
as we have heard during each beat, left ventricle performs mechanical work to eject blood in the circulation. This work could be displayed or equals the area of the left ventricular pressure, left ventricular volume loop, and correlates very highly and significantly with myocardial oxygen demand. However, this method is invasive and therefore is not so attractive for daily clinical use. So what were the steps leading from catheter-derived global myocardial work to completely non-invasive echo-derived segmental myocardial work? So firstly, in analogy to global myocardial work, which is derived as the area of the left ventricular pressure volume loop, regional or segmental myocardial work can be derived as the area of regional wall stress strain loop. This has been validated also already many years ago, but there was still a long way to go from this experimental setting to non-invasive clinical setting. Several important steps needed to be done. First, look at the x-axis. The strain in the experiment was usually assessed by sonomicrometry, inventing sonomicrometry crystals in the myocardium. Urheim et al. replaced strain by sonomicrometry by strain by tissue doppler echocardiography and validated this approach. So now we have on the x-axis strain by echo, it was tissue doppler at the time, now we use speckle tracking. What about the way axis? Way axis is regional wall stress, which is very challenging to measure even in the experiment. And there is no method to measure dialectic wall stress in the clinical setting. In the work of school stat, intracarvitary left ventricular pressure measured by tip manometer catheter used as the surrogate of regional wall stress. And he has validated this approach. And again, you can look at the loops and they look comparable using both approaches. So now we have strain by echo and invasive left ventricular pressure. The last important step was done by Russell in 2012, and he has replaced invasive left ventricular pressure by cuff brachial artery pressure and validated this approach during various hemodynamic experiments in dogs and in patients with different cardiac disorders. You can see very tight correlation between both approaches, both in experimental and clinical setting. And you can also appreciate on this individual example how the loops look similar using both approaches. He has also observed high correlation between pressure strain loop area by cuff blood pressure and regional myocardial glucose metabolism by PET. What is also important in that study, he has derived a reference pressure curve by pooling and averaging individual raw data of invasive flat ventricular pressure. And this is the curve just that is implemented in our analyzing software to assess myocardial work. To adjust this reference pressure curve to individual data, we have to insert brachial systolic pressure for the amplitude and also adjust for duration of isovolumic and ejection phases defined by mitral and aortic valve events by echocardiography. So this reference curve is stretched horizontally and vertically or compressed to adjust for the patient data. And you can also understand that this concept may be hampered by the patient when there is some obstruction between left ventricle and peripheral circulation, because then the assumption that the systolic blood pressure corresponds to the peak left ventricular pressure may not be valid. So we have seen that there is a lot of work and solid pathophysiological basis behind non-invasive assessment of myocardial work. So how to do it practically? Currently, there is only one GE, ECHOPAC, that allows or enables myocardial work assessment. Myocardial work module is extension of automated function imaging, which is the tool that we use to assess global longitudinal strain in three apical views. Alert. So again, you see immediately that to assess myocardial work, you need three apical views similar to the global longitudinal strain. Alert. So after comple completing the tracing Alert. of the strain, 
there will be myocardial work button appearing on the dropout menu. Second screen, you will be asked to indicate timing of valvular events, which are usually measured by pulse wave Doppler at the mitral valve level and aortic level, and checked visually in apical three chamber view, and you can still change it. And you will have to insert blood pressure. Then we are set to go, and you will be taken to the next screen when you have on the left bull eye of the segment of peak systolic longitudinal strain with global volume under the bull eye. And on the right, there is bull eye of segmental myocardial work index derived for each segment by this pressure strain loop area. You have also global work index, which is similar to global longitudinal strain calculated as average of segmental value. Currently, reference ranges for normal values for European population have been published. So normal value of global work index is around 1900 millimeter mercury percent. And the intra interruptual variability is similar to that of strain is less than 5%. You should be aware of the fact that global work index is increasing with age because of the increase in blood pressure. And this increase is significant mainly was significant in the study in women. All these data of all the segments and global values could be exported in the Excel file. And then there is also advanced work module in the echo pack, which brings a set of additional indices, which are used mostly in cardiomyopathy and selection of patients for cardiac synchronization therapy. These additional indices include constructive work again at the segmental and global level. Constructive work is calculated as work performed by the segment during shortening in systole and lengthening during isovolumic relaxation. Normal values are higher than those of global work index. Then is wasted work, which is work that is wasted, that does not contribute to ejection of blood to the circulation and represents energy loss. And then the last index that is provided is work efficiency, which is calculated as constructive work divided by constructive work and wasted work. The unit of work efficiency are percent and normal work efficiency, as we have heard, is between 94 and 97 percent. So now before going back to our case, I would like to emphasize again that global work index combines both deformation and afterload. Therefore, it may be useful in the situation when blood pressure changes, for example, between serial examinations, and where use of more load-dependent index, such as strain, can lead us to the wrong conclusion on myocardial function. This is the example of experimental study to illustrate this statement of aortic constriction. Arctic constriction was associated with increase in left ventricular pressure by 30 millimeter mercury and impairment in left ventricular strain by 4%. And this may falsely suggest myocardial dysfunction. However, if you look at the myocardial work represented by this pressure strain area on the right, you see there's decrease in the horizontal direction because of decrease in strain, but there is increase in the vertical direction because of increase in blood pressure. So the area remains the same. So this suggests no myocardial dysfunction as suggested by longitudinal strain. Another example is from the clinical study in patients with hypertension and preserved ejection fraction and patients with cardiomyopathy. Patient with hypertension shows significantly higher blood pressure than controls and significantly higher global work index. In contrast, global longitudinal strain was lower or not changed. So both these indices went to a different direction, reflecting situation of increased afterload, but relatively preserved myocardial function. In contrast, in patients with cardiomyopathy, both global longitudinal strain and myocardial work index were significantly lower than in controls, reflecting presence of severe myocardial disease. So now when we go back to our case, I believe now the interpretation will be easy. This is the patient with a drop in the strain between baseline and follow-up, but increase in the blood pressure and increase in the global work index. 
So this is no cardiac dysfunction and cancer therapy should be continued. In contrast, this is another example of different patients who showed also drop in global longitudinal strain between baseline and follow-up by 75%, but also drop in global work index, and by the way, also in ejection fraction. In contrast, blood pressure was similar between these two visits. So this is the case of really cancer treatment-related cardiac dysfunction and cancer therapy should be interrupted. So let me conclude my talk with multiple choice question, but I would like to ask you to select the correct answers. Global work index provides less load dependent estimate of left ventricular performance than global longitudinal strain. Normal global work index range in a healthy adult is between 800 and 1200 millimeter mercury percent. Global work index is a superior parameter of myocardial contractility than global longitudinal strain. And the last one, global work index shows high correlation with myocardial oxygen consumption. Okay, so now you have uh, voted and uh, cast your votes. And uh, the answers, uh, I'll read through the, uh, what you have uh, scored. The answer one uh, was 37%. Answer two got 5%. The answer alternative three got 30%. And the answer alternative number four got 29%. So there seems to be a relatively uh, uh, good distribution here uh, between the different answers. And maybe Dr. Finisha will comment on the uh, answers. So uh, these are, excuse me, these are according to my opinion, the correct answers. Uh, Global work index is less load dependent estimate of ventricular performance than strain because it incorporates blood pressure in the assessment. The answer two is not correct because the normal values are a bit higher than 800, 1200. The third uh, statement is tricky because when we talk about contractility, in my opinion, it's more strain rate than strain. So I, this is not correct. And the last one is correct. Uh, global work index shows high correlation with myocardial oxygen consumption. Okay, well, I think the audience picked up uh, most of the, uh, the messages and uh, the responses uh, reflected they had gotten uh, sort of the, the, the main part of the story about uh, what you can measure and what the myocardial work is reflecting. Okay, uh, then I think we can proceed to the uh, next speaker, uh, Professor Arvan Donal. So uh, please have the microphone. Yeah, now we are just sort of the technology is a uh, little bit uh, not, I wouldn't say advanced, but we still have to push the right button. Okay, it's okay. Um, it's okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so it's my pleasure to talk uh, just after Martin and after Otto about this uh, incredible tool that we can use nowadays in our daily clinical practice, so myocardial work. This is something that is useful to assess, as you saw already, the global myocardial function, but it's also something that you can use to assess regional function. I will try to show you how we can apply this technique in our daily clinical practice without losing any time because it takes less than two minutes to get the result. So first of all, I show you this uh, slide about the mean error between two measurements done on two exams in the same patient. And you see on the slide that the parameter that is the most robust 
when you do a transthoracic echocardiography in according to that study is the GLS. So it means that the one of the most robust tool that we have in echo is the speckle tracking assessment of the left ventricle. And for assessing the myocardial work, we will use this robustness of speckle tracking for the assessment of myocardial LV function. But of course, as it has been already said, when we look at a global longitudinal strain, we look at something that is close to active contraction of the myocardium, but we are not measuring the active contraction. We are measuring something that is close to myocardial contraction, but this is also, uh, also something that is impact and quite significantly impact by the loading condition. So when we use GLS, when we use global longitudinal strain, we use something that is better than LV ejection fraction for assessing LV systolic function, but still we use a parameter that is too load dependent in many clinical situations. I can illustrate that using this example of a patient with a severe aortic valve stenosis with a mean pressure gradient uh, of uh, 83 millimeter of mercury. And you see that the GLS is minus 40. As soon as you put a TAVI, so a few minutes later, you have a mean pressure gradient of 7.4 millimeter of mercury. And just because you decrease the afterload, you have a significant increase in GLS to minus 18. So it showed you how important are the loading condition on the uh, measurement of GLS. So to be able to measure more precisely the LV systolic function, we can use the myocardial stress. And to get the myocardial stress, we will have to assess the LV pressure and you will see, and you already saw, that we can now estimate the LV pressure thanks to the curve brachial artery systolic pressure. And we will use the uh, strain, the longitudinal strain, combined to this wall stress to get the myocardial work in this view. So really, we will have to measure the work which is the power multiplicated with the displacement. And for the myocardial work, we will combine the intra LV pressure with the LV strain, the global and the regional one. It has been demonstrated in Oslo, but also in our team, that we can really precisely measure or estimate the myocardial work when we use the cuff brachial artery systolic pressure. It has been demonstrated in the CAT lab that if we compare the measurement of myocardial uh, work uh, using uh, the invasive measurement of LV pressure or the cuff brachial artery systolic pressure, then using the timing of the mitral valve closure, closure and opening on aortic valve closure and opening, we get exactly the same results. And you see that the correlation between the invasive measurement and the non-invasive measurement is 0.97. There is some bias, but these bias are not impacting our dedicnical practice because the bias between invasive and non-invasive measurement has been only observed when the blood pressure is too high according to the clinical practice. So this is something that we can use in clinical practice. This is robust. This is very close to the invasive measurement of myocardial work. And then we can apply this technique in many clinical situations, in heart failure, when we have to assess a patient several times, and we can also use it to look at uh, the complicated subject that we deal with for years now. Uh, this is the mechanical dyssynchrony. And we were able, a few years ago, 
to demonstrate that using regional and global myocardial work in DC, we can predict the success rate according to the change in volume uh, when we use a CRT device uh, implantation in patients with left bundle branch block. And you see that with the global constructive work below 1,000 millimeter per percent, we can estimate the risk of non-response to cardiac resynchronization therapy, which is something that is quite interesting for the future. Just an example to show you how we can get this. So we have a patient with a dilated cardiomyopathy. We measure the GLS and combining the GLS and the blood pressure, we can get the myocard myocardial work indices. So we get the myocardial work efficiency. We get the constructive work. We get the worst, worsted work. And all these things can be measured for the global LV systolic function, but also for the regional one. And then if you look at the septum in this patient with the left bundle branch block, you see that the septum is completely inefficient to um, pushing the blood across the aortic valve. In opposite, the lateral wall is quite efficient enough to push the blood across the aortic valve during systole. But it's very nice to see that looking at the myocardial work just in the septum, you can easily understand why this patient has a low output. And of course, you can see this, this uh, nice graph showing how efficient is your patient and how large is the uh, wasted work in the, for the global um, LV or for each segment. It has been demonstrated that using the global work efficiency, you can predict the success rate of the CRT device implantation, and you can also check for the effect of the CRT device implantation Alert. after the implantation, and you see that you have a lot Alert. of wasted work in the septum before Alert. the implantation, but as soon as you implant the CRT Alert. device, you normalize the work efficiency, and the patient will be a good responder according to clinical evidence Alert. and according to LV modeling. Alert. And the beauty in that paper coming from Leiden Alert. is that you see GLS is still relevant, Alert. but you can add the myocardial work efficiency to GLS to improve your capability to predict the success rate of CRT device implantation in patients with the left bundle branch block. So this is something in addition to GLS. It will take two more minutes and it provides you something more. We were able to demonstrate that we can use this parameter to predict the reverse remodeling when we change the treatment from an S inhibitor to sacubitril valsartan. And you see that the, the risk of event, if you have a constructive work greater than 9,000 millimeter of mercury per percent is very low as compared to the patient who have a constructive work below 900 millimeter of mercury per percent when you start uh, the treatment by sacubitril valsartan. So it means that you can use this echocardiographic tool to define the risk of your patient when you have to decide for a CRT device implantation, but also when you have to manage the medical treatment. So it's not only for CRT device implantation, it's also when you want to implement, to improve the way you apply medical treatment in patients with heart failure. And it has been also showed that in a group of patients that you treat with a CRT device implantation, independently of the response in terms of LV remodeling, still constructive work with a cutoff value of eight 188 millimeter of mercury per percent can predict the risk of event. So this is a tool that is useful when you want to implant a CRT device, but also independently of the implantation of the CRT device and independently of the reverse modeling after the implantation of the CRT device. 
Maybe we can discuss another topic. For instance, this patient, this is a patient with an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And uh, when you look at the systolic function of this patient with an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can look, of course, at the LV ejection fraction. And I don't provide you the uh, measurement here, but you can estimate that the LV ejection fraction is something like 80%, uh, percent, so very high LV ejection fraction. Ah, there is something wrong with the slide. Um, uh, so I don't have the slide anymore, but I will try to continue. Um, so if you look at the GLS, you see, um, I don't see, but maybe you see uh, that we have um, a decrease in um, the strain value in the lateral wall. And this decrease in strain value in the lateral wall can be assessed using the myocardial work software. And using the myocardial work software, so using the GLS plus the blood pressure, you will be able to get the global LV systolic function with the work efficiency and the global work index. You can assess the wasted work, which is very low in a patient with an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can check for the regional function. Ah, I get the slide, so it's nice. Uh, I will try to find a good one. Okay, uh, so the good slide is, so this was the slide that I was discussing. So you see that we have a decrease in uh, the strain value in the lateral wall at the basal segment. You can check that using the myocardial work in the indices and you can look at regional function. If you look at the septum, you see that the myocardial work is preserved. The myocardium is thick, but the systolic function, the work of this segment is quite normal with a very low level of wasted work. If you look at the basal segment of the lateral wall, you see that the myocardial work is close to zero. You have a very low level of work in this segment. It means that you have a segment that has a very low metabolism, according to what Martin showed you before. If we have a very low or no metabolism in this segment, it probably means that there is some degree of fibrosis in that segment. And we can easily see that uh, there is no uh, function here and this no function is related to the fibrosis of the lateral wall. And as it has been shown previously, it is clear now that there is a clear link between the myocardial metabolism and the myocardial wall. And you can get this globally, but also regionally, as you see for this uh, patient with an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but also as you can see in patient with ischemic heart disease. So you can use this capability of uh, regional myocardial work to get close to the myocardial metabolism and to check for the presence of fibrosis or ischemia in a segment. So this is quite new. This is quite powerful according to what we do when we use only the longitudinal strain capability. So my key points for this talk are that it seems quite easy to integrate myocardial work indices in our daily clinical practice because it takes two minutes. It is nice because it pushes you to get the blood pressure in every single patient. So you can have, thanks to this blood pressure, thanks to this systolic blood pressure, an estimate of the LV pressure and you we can use this estimate of the LV pressure to get the myocardial work. We know that longitudinal strain is robust and to get myocardial work, we use this robustness of longitudinal strain. 
and we improve the value of longitudinal frame because we improve the sensitivity of the assessment of LV global, but also regional function. And it's very important to look at the global value, to look at the um, myocardial work index, but also to the myocardial work, po the positive myocardial work and the wasted myocardial work. And you can look at that globally and regionally, as I showed you, for a patient with a stress device and for a patient with an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it's also true for a patient with an ischemic heart disease, or as you saw already, after uh, uh, initiation of uh, chemotherapy. So to make sure that you understood quite nicely the importance to integrate myocardial work in your daily clinical practice, I have two questions for you. The first one is myocardial work is something to analyze in addition to strain data or not? Something to consider instead of strain data? Do you think that myocardial work is to look at only globally? Do you think that we have to consider myocardial work when we have an artist valve stenosis? And then I think you can vote. Okay, still about 20 minutes to vote, so uh, first to vote, please. Alert. 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 Okay, well, here we have the answers. The uh, question number two has uh, four answers, and the first one uh, got 88% to analyze in addition to the strain data. The next second answer alternative got only 1%, and the next one eight, and the last one four. So the majority seem to think, based upon the lecture, that strain is analyzed in a uh, work in addition to the strain data, and a comment from, from you, Ervan. Yes, so I'm happy to see that because, of course, when you have to measure the myocardial work, you are first have to get the GLS. So, of course, we look at the value of GLS and we will improve the sensitivity of your assessment of LV systolic function, considering the um, addition of uh, the estimate of LV pressure to the GLS. So it's nice to integrate this tool in addition to GLS. It's important to look at it globally, but also sometimes regionally, when we check for a patient for CRP, when you check for the presence of fibrosis or ischemia in a specific segment. <coughs> and could we use uh, myocardial work in this is in our valve stenosis? No, we can't up to now because we use the tough Bracha's systolic artery pressure and if you have a pressure gradient between the aortic valve and the aortic pressure, of course, your estimate of LV, uh, LV pressure is not possible. So it will probably be possible soon because maybe you know that there is a paper in PLOS one showing that we can still estimate the LV pressure using an additive uh, equation. But up to now, we cannot use uh, myocardial work in this case in aortic valve stenosis. So maybe I can uh, go to the last uh, MCQ. So this is the uh, one about also myocardial work, of course. It says, do you think that myocardial work is nice when you follow a patient and when the loading conditions change? Second question, do you think that it's nice in ischemic heart disease for assessing regional function? Do you think that it's nice in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? And last question, do you think that it's nice for analyzing the myocardial function of a patient with an amyloidosis? So now you can vote.
got about 20 uh, seconds to vote. Okay, the answers to this uh, question are as follows. The uh, first answer got 72%. Nice when you follow a patient when the loading conditions are changing. The uh, next answer got, the uh, alternative got 13%. Nice in ischemic heart disease. And the next one in Hokum got 6%. And the final one, uh, amyloidosis got 9%. So, any comments, uh, Irvan? Yes. Uh, so, thank you very much uh, for these answers. Uh, I think that it's very important, as it has been said by Martin, that when you follow a patient, for instance, during a chemotherapy treatment, you know that the blood pressure might change uh, from one uh, measure, uh, one echo to the other one. So, really, it's uh, important to consider the assessment of myocardial work in addition to GLS for the follow-up. It's true for chemotherapy patients, but it's also true for patients with uh, chronic heart failure. When you follow a patient with a chronic heart failure, you want to assess the change in LV function according to the treatment that you decided to, to give to the patient. And it's very important to consider the blood pressure in addition to the strain and to the um, LV ejection fraction. So adding uh, myocardial work to our daily clinical practice in chronic heart failure patient is probably something that we have to consider. For ischemic heart, fail, uh, ischemic heart diseases, it is nice to use GLS. It has been said and written for few, many years now but it's perhaps better to consider myocardial work because of this impact of the work stress on the intrinsic uh, contractility of uh, ischemic segment. So probably we are more sensitive using myocardial work in this field than only looking on, at uh, um, uh, global longitudinal strain because we integrate this work stress. But of course, as it has, been, it has been said before, strain rate is probably better, but more difficult to apply in clinical practice. So if we cannot apply strain rate in our clinical practice, better than longitudinal strain, we can look at uh, myocardial work in this field. I think this is a key message. In our con, of course, we cannot use um, myocardial work because of this gradient between the LV and the aorta that makes impossible the estimate of LV pressure. In amyloidosis, it is also interesting to integrate the assessment of myocardial work because in this patient, the change over time of LV ejection fraction, GLS, might be impacted by the change in loading condition. These patients are very severe. The work stress is quite high sometimes and you have to increase the diuretic. And to best estimate the LV global function, using work instead of GLS is probably better. It's not demonstrated yet, but according to my practice, I think that it is quite robust and useful to best um, decide how you manage the diuretic treatment. So I think that really myocardial work is something new. It's something more than what we have already, but it's really something that we can use in our daily clinical practice. Okay, well, thank you everyone for a very insightful, uh, nice uh, lecture. Uh, now we are moving to some uh, questions we have received from uh, US audience and uh, let me start with one. And um, one question is, uh, which of the myocardial work parameters is the most important? Maybe one of you would like to answer. 
Ivan or Monty? Uh, uh, yes, if I may, uh, the constructive work is quite important, uh, but it's not enough. You can, and actually you have uh, the four numbers on the screen and you can look at the um, constructive work, as I said, but just, be, uh, just below you have the wasted work and this wasted work is quite interesting too because in a DCM patient, is a patient with a chronic heart failure, to see that you have a lot of wasted work is something quite interesting to push you to decide or not to implant a stretch device. So it's quite interesting to look at the four, the four parameters. But of course, if you have just to look at only one parameter, the global work index is probably the most uh, useful. Yeah, that's a nice answer. You would like to know how much work is done and how much other work is wasted. So that makes sense. Now, there is one question about the, um, if you also display the slides of GLS on the same sort of display as the work, I guess that's what you do, right? Yes, we have, we have uh, all, all, uh, always the GLS and the um, global work index uh, bull eyes on the screen. Now there's a question about, uh, is there a cut point for what is the normal work index? And you have some slides, but do you have like a brief message on that? Yes, you shouldn't be uh, below 1,900 if you are a normal patient for the global uh, work index. So 1,900, it's the normal value. If you want is to- Is that the average? Average value or not the lower, lower normal? Ah, it's the global normal? value. It's the no, the average value, one thousand nine hundred, according to yeah. my practice at least. Yeah. Very good. And um, then is a question here: is uh, how immediate can you see depressed function following chemotherapy when using work? Is it faster than the strain? Martin. Uh, but I, I think uh, it's not uh, faster, but uh, it helps uh, mostly in this situation when there's the difference in the blood pressure. Yeah. I don't think it's faster. So in fact, if you have a patient which for some reason is nervous and has a high blood pressure, which will take down the strain, the work might be okay. So it might sort of get to give you a better image uh, or understanding of the state of the heart because you incorporate the blood pressure in the measure. That's great. There's one here about the, uh, can you do strain and work in atrial fibrillation and left bundle branch block? So for left bundle branch block, it's clear you have to, <laughs> I should say, uh, because it's powerful yeah. to predict the, uh, the, 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 to see who are the patient that might be suitable for CRT. According to atrial fibrillation, it's a little bit tricky uh, because it's not easy to get uh, the same um, the same heart rate in several um, cycles. So you can use the three D capabilities or the three plane capabilities of your probe, and then you will be able to get GLS. And if you have GLS, you have myocardial work. So you can still use it uh, if you have a stupid probe. Yeah, getting a little bit back to the issue with the uh, chemotherapy and cardiotoxicity. And the question is, is there a clinical study that proves that work is superior to strain in assessment of cardiotoxicity in chemotherapy? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, there is uh, nothing published in Extenso, but there are abstracts coming from the Tom Marwick group uh, that shows uh, this uh, that myocardial work may be superior to global longitudinal strain in some situations. So the study is ongoing, but maybe not yet finished. It's not yet finished, right? and oh. I cannot disclose the results. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now this one, and uh, if you can assess uh, myocardial scar with uh, work. I guess we can, as I showed you uh, in uh, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient, if you um, 
look at segment per segment, you will be able to see who are the segments with no myocardial work. And if there is no myocardial work or quite no myocardial work, it means that this segment is totally inefficient and probably fibrotic. Yeah. Now this one, which uh, relates to uh, MRI or CMR, and the question is, uh, can the measure work by CMR? Uh, you know the answer, I think. Uh, you Maybe you can comment. Well, we have a publication from uh, uh, Camilla, uh, working with Nisha, a fellow, Camilla Larson. She has a publication showing that, uh, coming out, which showing that you actually can measure work by CMR. You know, the second or the tracking of the segments in CMR is uh, feasible. It's a little bit sort of tricky sometimes, but it's uh, as principle. Yes, you can measure work with CMR. Now, uh, maybe we have, we are approaching the end, not yet, but we are approaching the end of this, uh, this uh, session. And um, I would uh, like then to try to conclude uh, from these uh, great lectures by two world experts uh, in the field, um, Ervan and Martin. And I think we can say that the work method has come and it's a major improvement, we think, in the assessment of left ventricular pump function. And the key messages about work at this stage for technical application may be that work is measured by strain combined with non-invasive LD pressure. That's the method, which is done by echo and cuff pressure. Furthermore, uh, work may be superior to ejection fraction and strain since it incorporates the pressure, the absolute. Furthermore, and importantly now, the promise that the selection of a CRT candidate, patient to be, get CRT, has been one of the most interesting applications of the work method. And there are several promising publications. As I mentioned, there is a paper to come in the European Heart Journal. I cannot tell you the results because of the embargo but it's from our, all the three speakers today or in the panel today are part of the trial. And if you stay tuned, reading the European Heart Journal, you'll read about it in a few weeks. And finally, the work method is promising for detecting cardiotoxic effects of chemotherapy, as you saw in this uh, nice cases from, uh, from the speaker today. So uh, don't, think, don't be frustrated about, about a little bit of complexity get out there and train and use it, and you will be, I think, very happy after a while. In most patients, it's feasible. So thank you for attending this uh, seminar, and thank you to the speakers for great lectures. Thank you. Thank you Goodbye. very much. Thank you. Goodbye.